Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a nice break, fun break, got to know each other. I'd like to welcome back our contest host master, Lindsay Keeper. Thank you, Madam Contest Chair. Did everybody get up to eat? Did you meet somebody that you haven't spoken to before, Dorothy? Mm -hmm. Did you meet Dorothy? I met Chip and I met Amy. Yay, all right. someone who has a short attention span, who is easily distracted. But worse, it's usually used to indicate that somebody isn't that bright, maybe even stupid. Birds, however, are actually very intelligent creatures. Their brain size is larger relative to their bodies than most animals in the animal kingdom. They have more neural connections than some members of the ape family. Madam Toastmaster, Madam Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests, I am here to tell you not only from my reading that birds are intelligent, but also from my own experience. For the last three and a half years, I have had the privilege of raising backyard chickens. And I have come to learn that chickens are not that stupid. I have six, Hazel, Bella, Chica, Eclipse, Magic, and who did I forget? Phoenix. And they each have their own specific personality. Not only that, they act as a brood. And they're very friendly to each other. Even though there's a pecking order, they look out for each other. They're very intelligent creatures. Some mornings, they'll jump up onto my lap when I'm outside reading. They're looking for food, of course, and food is what drives them. 
and they eat almost anything. Plants, grass, seeds, worms, frogs, bugs, and then they put out these beautiful pasture-raised eggs on a daily basis. Delicious. It's amazing. Even their poop is smart. <laughs> Basically, full of nitrogen. And it goes into my garden and gives me great, luscious goods and plants. They also keep themselves very clean. And you know how they do this? They do this through dust baths. They get a bunch of dirt and they throw it all up into every nook and cranny and they're rolling around and it must be very pleasurable. The eyes are rolling back in their head. It reminds me of a pleasantly drunk person in a hot tub. <laughs> Not that I've ever done that. In Arizona. Sunny. Never mind. <laughs> they are very intelligent. They take that dirt and they get it up in there and it kills mites. It kills parasites. And then when they're done, they get up and poof, a big cloud of dust, and they're strutting their bug-free, clean selves. <laughs> they're amazing. They're also very predator aware. For there are many predators that would like to eat my girls for lunch. And so at night, when the dusk comes, they start to come and get closer to the coop, for they know that's where safety is. And I get them in there and lock them up. Sometimes, however, during the day, I have to leave for a while, and I want to bring them in, and they don't want to come in. They are 50, 100 yards out, and I start calling, chickens, come on, chickens. I'm not sure why it is we raise our voice like that in a high pitch, but I think we think animals think we understand that a bit more. So I say, chickens, and they just look up. <laughs> and then they, they're like, they may, be, they may be just found some worm smorgasbord, and they're not going anywhere. They're looking at each other. Oh, man, we're not going anywhere. Get him. And I got to go into the brambles. I got to go with the kit, get stickers all over you. And it's, it's not a good thing. Now, this was until I discovered the secret weapon. Honey roasted peanuts. <laughs> so now, when I go out, when I say chickens, I bring that jar of honey roasted peanuts. <laughs> I start shaking that, and instantly they're like, <laughs> <laughs> and there's a couple reasons for this. First of all, they love the taste. But the second reason is this, because sometimes they actually resist. They're like, oh, we got some good stuff here. I don't you know. I, 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 I. But here's the thing as soon as one of them breaks, the other five are right behind. Girl, you're not getting my peanuts. <laughs> it's just their nature. So they come up. I'm throwing peanuts in the coop. They're running in. One, two, three, four, five, six. Click, lock it. <laughs> they got us again. <laughs> now that doesn't sound that smart, does it? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here tonight to tell you that I have observed similar behavior in human beings. <laughs> and this is particularly true when it comes to the area of relationships and romance. I myself have been through two very painful breakups in the last couple of years. And we all deal with matters of the heart in different ways. Let's see if you, maybe you recognize this. It was a period where I just feeling sorry for myself. I'm never going out again. Too much trouble. But I want to do that again. I'm going to be single the rest of my life. Phone rings. Hi, Jim. Hello. What's she doing? <laughs> Nothing. I was thinking of watching a movie. Want to come over? <laughs> There's no resistance. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, human beings cannot resist the taste of romance. And even if you can, you're afraid somebody else is going to get there first. <laughs> so when you like someone, there you go. The next time you hear the phrase bird brain, or someone tells you that chickens aren't that bright, just remember, chickens are not that stupid. <laughs> or are they? <laughs> <laughs>
Martina Matisse. The third option. <coughs> the third option, Martina Matisse. <laughs> When I was first married, I thought, wouldn't it be fun to have a baby? Wouldn't that be fabulous, fulfilling to have a child? Which is interesting because on the day that I gave birth, fun, fulfilling, and fabulous were not the F words I used to describe <laughs> the experience. <laughs> Actually, I had quadruplets. Very efficient pregnancy, four babies, one pregnancy. It was like going to Costco. <laughs> calling my first they, but I did. And I wanted to learn, I wanted to learn everything that I could about motherhood, so I read. I read books like How to Raise Creative, Resourceful Children, that's a good title. I wanted to know everything. What I didn't know was that child psychology and science fiction fantasy is the same thing. I could have read Tolkien for my parents. <laughs> I read Raising Happy Multiples. You see, they're called multiples, not just because of their birth circumstance, but because of the magnitude of messes and mayhem that they manufacture multiply at seismic <laughs> proportions when they work together. And this I know for a fact. One day, I got out of the shower all fresh and clean and flabbergasted to discover that my kids had taken the changing table and pushed it into the walk-in closet up against the wall. They climbed up the outside like a ladder, got onto the top like a diving platform, and literally dove into the closet, <coughs> grabbing onto the hangers, sliding down the fabric and control fall into a pile of everything from every drawer in the room. <laughs> I thought it was a five-minute shower, but problem, there was no poof like leaves in the fall. So my kids are resourceful and creative, right? They took house plants by the stem, shook the root balls, and dirt. <laughs> they got the poof. Yeah. <laughs> Did I rant? Did I rave? No, 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 no. I read. I read and I read and I read until they grew up. And finally the day came for me to give those books away to the next new mom, my neighbor. Oh, she was perfect. She was young. She was filled with optimism. She was totally delusional. The books <laughs> were perfect for her. So I started to stack them up to bring over, and I came across a book that I don't remember reading. It was kind of mysterious looking. It was leather bound with no printing on the cover, gold on the edge. I don't remember this book. I started flipping through the pages, and I started reading and that is when it was revealed to me. The third option, there's a third option for parenting. It isn't just anger and frustration or love and acceptance. There's a third option. And it is that third option that I'm here to tell you about today. And you can use it. Not just for little kids, it works for adult children too. Would you like to know what the third option is? Yes. 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 The third option, my friends, is to become an evil <laughs> I simply had to wait for an opportunity to exercise my new malevolent monarch. And I didn't have to wait long. My daughter walked out of her bedroom with her navel pierced. <laughs> she did it herself. How shall I respond? I am now an evil queen. When she turned and walked away from me, I ran up her back, wrapped my legs round her neck, tied them into a knot, and squeezed as hard as I could until that little navel bubble popped out. <laughs> <laughs> it hit the wall, ricocheted off the mirror, and came back to ping her in her head. <laughs> Tell me, do you have fuzzy little toys lying about your house? Are you taking your children to ballet class and to soccer practice? <laughs> You're so naive. <laughs> investing in their development, you should be investing in your own development. Sleep on a mat, stale bread, hard in your heart. <laughs> My son came home with a logo of his favorite video game tattooed on his chest. <laughs> we miss him very much. <laughs> <laughs> My son's a 
the prophet to the gypsies. His brother, my other son, decided he should like to become the Marlboro Man. Smoking in the house after dinner every night. Really? Did I guide him? Did I talk to him into a better decision? No. I called the Department of Homeland Security and learned how to waterboard. <laughs> it's very satisfying. <laughs> Finally, my daughter, pretty girl, has a boyfriend. His name is Derelict. Or Daryl or Derek or something. They're to be married. They've chosen a zombie-themed wedding. A zombie-themed wedding? Over my dead body? Oh, my daughter protested. Mother Dara loves zombie films. It'll be so novel, don't you think? If you have a zombie-themed wedding, you'll have to step over my bloody body to get to him. I'll throw it down the aisle. <laughs> my daughter responded with so much earnestness and so much sincerity. She said, Mother, how lovely of you. Your bloody body will match our decor. <laughs> <laughs> it was with that simple statement, my dear Toastmaster friends, that I realized I must abandon the third option, no matter how much I might enjoy it. I must find that book and close it for ever. And in doing so, I just realized that all I can do is hope for the best and pray to God they make it. But I would keep the cape. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Tyner, we have one minute on the clock, please. has a winter. It's the far north calling. It's the far north calling. Sue has a winter. I have reached that age where when they say it happened 40 years ago or it happened 50 years ago, I realize I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how time goes by and how those memories that come when you're young rise to the surface at the oddest times. I was driving down Route 14 out here where we were all driving to come to this event and I'm driving by one of the auto shops and in the parking lot was an El Camino. And it took me back to 1969 and my father's turquoise blue El Camino. Now you know what an El Camino is, the truck that wished it was a car. <laughs> <laughs> and I never thought of my dad really as a turquoise blue kind of guy, but he had, maybe it was what was on the lot, I don't know, he had this turquoise blue El Camino. For that summer, my dad and my sisters and I were going on a family camping trip. And we were going to this strange and often open place. We were going to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'd never been there. It was strange and unknown. Now, there is a problem with an El Camino. Remember, my dad, 
sister one, sister two, me. How many people fit on a bench seat? Three. How many people did we have? Four. <laughs> what do you do with a spare child? <laughs> Even back then, it was illegal to have them ride in the bed for eight hours. You know, the back of the truck. However, there's this gap behind the seat. <laughs> It is just wide enough for a grade school child. Now, it does give new meaning to that argument about who gets to sit on the hump. <laughs> because you laid on the hump. But one of us who lost the draw got to ride up to Minnesota behind the seat of the El Camino. And what was behind the El Camino was a trailer. This was before the tiny home movement, and I don't think this house would have cut it even for size on that. It said it slept seven. In somebody's dreams it slept seven. <laughs> However, the reason we were going to Minnesota was to meet up with my dad's parents and my cousin, my grandmother, the Girl Scout leader. Went by the motto, be prepared, and in my grandfather's tank Chevy, was a three-person tent, <coughs> which solved a lot of the crowding problems. We went up to Bird Lake, Manitoba. I have no idea why. I don't know why that particular site was chosen, but it was on the last road to nowhere, which for some reason was under construction to be a four-lane <laughs> highway, and it had rained for an entire week before we got there. And the El Camino performed valiantly. But before we knew it, all three sets of axles were mired midway, and that El Camino was not going anywhere. But I'll tell you something, Canadians are very nice. The road crew brought over a road grader, chained my dad's El Camino to it, took off down the highway, and the trailer is going <laughs> like this. My grandfather is behind in the Chevy with the old man hat and the pipe clenched in his teeth and he's looking at the trailer as it's going back and forth. But we made it. And we got to the campground. So now it was time for another lottery. Which kid got to sleep in the tent? Well, we did it on a rotating basis. And sleeping in the tent was a bit of an adventure because my grandfather snored, and he talked in his sleep. And one night, my grandmother and I are in the tent, and we're talking, and Grandpa is over there <coughs> sawing wood. And all of a sudden, he says, I love you. And my grandmother looked over at him <laughs> and said, it better be me. <laughs>
power. OCD. Yeah, you know me. <laughs> OCD. Yeah, you know me. Jim Howard. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, and honored guests. Tonight, my goal is to hopefully entertain you and give you some insight into what OCD is and my personal struggle with it. OCD is an anxiety disorder. It's defined as having unwanted thoughts or behaviors as of compulsions. There are a plethora of different disorders that are out there. But since this is about me, I'm going to talk about the ones I suffer from. I've got hand washing issues, cleaning, checking, repeating, checking, repeating, <laughs> and repeating. August 3rd, 2014, I'm on my way to a seminar in Orlando. First time I've ever traveled by myself. So my anxiety issue is, is, is bubbling up. Before I leave the house, I want to go check a few things. I want to go check my coffee pot. I want to go check the stove. Coffee pot, stove. Coffee pot, stove. Cool, that was three. But then the stove, I had to check the knobs. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. <laughs> Fine, happy and satisfied. Dad pulls up. I put my luggage to the car. We're going to go to over here, but I jump out of the car because I have to see if I lock the door. Get out of the car. Turn it out. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. <sighs> Thank you. We get into the car. On our way to over here. Every three minutes, I'm checking keys, wallet, ticket, keys, wallet, ticket, keys, wallet, ticket. It was maddening. How many times I checked that? I finally get to O'Hare. I look at my watch. I'm two hours early. Can you guess how many hours I would like to have gotten there? <laughs> Who said that? <clears throat> Three? Yes! <laughs> OCD! <laughs> you know me! Yes! <laughs> Alright, that's great. You want to? Two hours early, I'm running, I'm booking to my gate. I'm running, I'm running. Luckily, it was gate three. Sweet! <laughs> so now, I'm looking for a seat to sit down. Oh, found my seat. But then I just noticed that I just took my carry-on and rolled it through a white crusty puddle right next to me. My first thought is, is it foreign? Is it domestic? Is it from Detroit? I just don't know. Absolutely freaking out. Now, as anybody else that suffers from anxiety, what's the best thing for anxiety? Caffeine. Time to go get some coffee. Awesome, I'm stoked. So I'm McDonald's. I ran over there. I'm standing in line. I happen to see this lady in front of me. Big. Blessed lady, <laughs> but very sweaty. I don't know why she was so sweaty. She looked like she just got done swimming with Michael Phelps. I don't get what was her problem. But what I did notice was she paid for her order in all dollar bills. Guess where those came from? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Ladies, I don't know what goes on up here. Just ask me. That's my wife. I don't know. I'm a Catholic. I don't go there. <laughs> Before I even could even process what was going on, I heard someone say next. I said, "Oh, cool, me. Can I get a medium coffee?" She says, "Dollar eighty-eight. 
Awesome, here's a 20. Before I even thought about it, the lady hands me back 18 very wet booby juice dollars. So now, I'm starting to freak out. I look at my, 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 but before she, she gave me the booby box back. She had to count them to, back to me, too. <coughs> but guess how she counted them? Now remember, I'm a germaphobe. And these are wet dollar bills. One, <laughs> two, three, no. four. So I've got 18 booby bucks taunting me. Now, grab a hold of myself, put the booby bucks in my pocket. Go back with my cup of coffee. Sit down, just keep right to just chill out. Take my cup of, cup, cup of coffee. <sighs> That's what happens when that coffee and that bran muffin that I just woke down before <laughs> met on an atomic bomb. Now my second worst nightmare in the whole world is going to come true. A bathroom. But not only a bathroom, it's the airport bathroom. So now I have to find a bathroom. Like true to Western style, I stroll over to the bathroom like a cowboy. But not really like a cowboy, because that muffin was going to come flying out of me. Like a Civil War cannonball. It would fly out of me under the international criminals at midway. <laughs> Finally, I get into the bathroom, I find the stall that I want. I sit there, I bow to it. Because now I go into the Karate Kid move, movie. So I'm not going to touch it. Raise my arms up. <laughs> Kick that door open. I got on in. Did what I needed to do. Oh, thank God. Toilet seat liners. Thank God I'm not going to get Zika today on this from the toilet. <laughs> How many toilet seat liners do you think I used? Three! into a bathroom ninja. I flushed with my foot, I opened the door with my, with my leg, and I got out just perfectly. Guys, there's, I've got more issues than a box of tissues. There is a, the way to treat OCD is not, not really easy. You can treat it with meds, or you can treat it with physical therapy, or um, therapy where you face your fear. Like my favorite movie, What About Bob? <laughs> Dr. Leo Marvin says baby steps. And it's always about baby steps, the baby steps, the baby steps. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster.
Madam Toastmaster, we have all the ballots. She writes, alive and healthy. 
Disappoints. 
else, whether it's in person, on Facebook, Tim is a fantastic, incredible person who I never see what's coming next. Wherever you put on your mouth, I can never anticipate. That's a compliment, by the way. Thank you. Jim, your club name and number. <clears throat> Brian is our president, Crystal Clear Toastmasters, 909922. Okay, and yes. how long have you been Toastmasters? Uh, coming up on seven years. Seven years already? Wow. Yes. Mm -hmm. And your designation? I am ACB and ALB. What inspires you the most? Nature? Givers of themselves, those who overcome adversity. Tell us your biggest inspiration. What about it? Nature is a huge inspiration for me, and I think people can see that. Anybody who sees my photos knows I go out quite often to yeah. be in nature and to experience the cycles of nature, which is why I try to watch sunrise and sunset when possible at the right time of the year. Tomorrow's equinox. Right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I find, um, I also live, I'm fortunate enough to live on a, what is essentially a forest preserve with tons of animals and all kinds of nature. Chickens. Uh, and chickens, <laughs> who uh, I try to keep from the nature. But uh, nature is probably my number one um, motivator and also uh, has a lot to do with what I do in my spare time as well. Okay, well I could ask you many more questions yeah, for you to keep this going. If anybody's on Facebook, if you want some interesting, beautiful photographs, Jim is a truly inspirational photographer. And you get to see all the monkey pictures. He can tell you more about that. But Thank you. Outstanding job. Martina Matisson. And I always say that because I remember Bill Ruth would correct anybody who did not say your name right. You'd be in the back of the room. It's Matisson. <laughs> For those of you who knew Bill. Martina, how are you tonight? It's wonderful. Club fun. number. Crystal Lynn? 2724. Very good. And how long have you been a member? This could be interesting. Well, I, I joined 21 years ago, and then I had the quads, and I left. And then I came back, and here I am. We have no time with quads. That's <laughs> and so you, you are here, and your designation? CC. CC. Very good. The third option. Notable accomplishments and awards. Oh, you knew I have to ask about this. Most likely to trip and fall 2016. <laughs> <laughs> you want to explain? It's a skill. I, I a have, skill. I have a, like a radar ability to walk, and if there's a small discrepancy in the sidewalk, I'll find it and trip over it as public service to others behind me. So <laughs> <Okay. laughs> I appreciate that. And, uh, by the way, you're probably going to know how to answer this because I've tripped in the time. What is the first thing that goes through your head when you fall flat on your face? I hope I'm not wearing a skirt. <laughs> <laughs> that too, but also who saw me. Oh, yes. <laughs> no, nice job. <laughs>
So you would have this woodpecker about yay big up there on the sewer feeder. You couldn't miss them. And it's always just so fascinating. You sit there and stare out the window. My cats stare out the window. They're bird watchers too. <laughs> and see what's hanging out on the feeders on any given morning. Very nice. Well, thank you for participating. <laughs> Guy too. Well, name and number. It would be uh, Curie Grove Toastmasters Club 104 8321. He's cheating, but we'll let you. We'll let you. We'll, we'll let that you. slide. That's how I got through high school. <laughs> 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 I love that. Is that a notable comment? Huh? <laughs> Don't. That's you never write that stuff down. So very sharp. And how long have you been a Toastmaster? Oh, uh, maybe about two years. Two years. And your designation? I think my fifth speech. Okay, nice job. We'll just keep going. <laughs> what interesting is James and I were friends on Facebook, and I have a band that I've been following a long time, Mr. Myers. And he, it, it's an obscure band, not widely known. He knows them. He's followed them for years. I know them. I've followed them for years. So that's what happens when you get to know people in Toastmasters. The world becomes very small when you actually interact. So. I'm off on a little side, but that, I remember that. I mean, like, how? Oh, I don't know anybody else other than my own personal circle. I came to my college players. like uh, 20 years ago. And played. Fantastic. And OCD, yeah, you know me. Yep. That was your speech title. I am a little surprised I hadn't taken you, hadn't been to you for OCD. I'm borderline. Um, when I'm in the kitchen at work, we have drawers for everything. The, the freezers are drawers, the refrigerators are drawers, the trash is a drawer. And people will leave them slightly open. And do you get it? When I walk around the corner and I see that, my mind just explodes. Yes. You just cannot do that. As I became, Tell us more about as I started building my own personal business and left the corporate world, where everything was regimen, and I was just really good at what I was, what I was doing, and I got really bored of it, and that's why I just got out of it. When you become an entrepreneur, you have to start thinking and realizing, like you said, perfection. It's, it's really not existed and if you're looking for perfection you're just really going to drive yourself crazy and with that when I was at work my corporate job everything had to be perfect everything was regimen I had to go and I was rocking I was rolling and then it just got boring but now since I'm on my own you can't quite like be like that and then with OCD if you still start addressing some of this stuff it does blossom that's just tiny little piece of the issues that, that that go on on an everyday basis. That was pretty fascinating. I could relate to a lot of your story, so you better get the hand sanitizer right now.
the evaluation contact with your draw roll. Yeah. And then you have to Brian Stallard.